Welcome to the second session guest lecture on the application of artificial intelligence for early medicine in the post-pandemic era. Yeah, first thing first, let us briefly explain our agenda in this session. In just about a moment, we will have guest speaker Prof. Yu Chuan Jack Lee, who will share about the application of artificial intelligence for earlier medicine in the post-pandemic era. The discussion will be led by Dr. Lutfan Lazuardi as the moderator. After discussion, this webinar will be closed by the price announcement and closing remarks. So first of all, let me show you the profile of our moderator. Dr. Lutfan Lazuardi is now Head of Health Policy and Management Department, Faculty of Medicine, Public Health and Nursing, UGM. Dr. Lutfan got medical doctor at Faculty of Medicine, UGM, Master in Public Health or Health Service Management at Faculty of Medicine, UGM, and PhD at Innsbruck Medical University, Innsbruck, Austria. Then let me tell you the profile of our speaker. Prof. Yu Chuan Jack Lee, or Prof. Lee, is a pioneer of artificial intelligence in medicine and translational biomedical informatics. Prof. Lee is now distinguished professor at Taipei Medical University, dermatologist at Taipei Municipal Won Fang Hospital, and president-elect at International Medical Informatic Association. Prof. Lee got medical doctor at Taipei Medical University and PhD at medical, uh, on medical informatics at the University of Utah School of Medicine. So, Dr. Lutfan, for the opening remark, please. Ya, yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, selamat pagi, Bapak Ibu semua. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, salam sejahtera. Uh, ya, yeah, um, it's really a, a great pleasure uh, to have uh, Dr. Uh, Professor uh, Jack Lee here, uh, which is uh, uh, very famous on uh, um, introducing the artificial intelligence into the medicines. And uh, today we are very happy to uh, have you uh, here. And I think. Uh, Um, Hanifa already uh, introduced uh, uh, our uh, guest uh, professors, but uh, maybe uh, let me also a uh, little bit uh, briefly introduce uh, Professor Jackley again uh, to the audience. Um, yeah, uh, Professor Jackley uh, currently uh, serve as uh, uh, the president-elect of the International Medical Informatic Associations, which is, I think, uh, the uh, most uh, prestigious uh, organizations related to the medical informatics. And uh, as your information also, Professor uh, Jackley, that uh, most of the audience is actually uh, the uh, higher member of the higher university that uh, dealing with the uh, medical record as well as with the health informatics. So this time is, I think, a really uh, great uh, pleasure uh, that we can uh, meet uh, together. And Um, yeah, we are very happy to learn from the first hands uh, related to the earlier medicine, which is, I think, uh, to us, uh, this uh, term is uh, probably uh, new, but I think we will uh, have uh, clear uh, information uh, from uh, Professor Jack Lee. And yeah, uh, to uh, not uh, uh, further ado, we invite Professor uh, Jack Lee uh, to deliver uh, the speech and yeah again thank you very much and uh, we really sure that it will uh, benefit uh, all of us so we are looking forward uh, to your uh, talk Professor Jack Lee thank you thank you Dr. Natsuwadi um, uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, let me try to open my slide first okay So, uh, okay, can you see my slides? Yes, yeah. Okay, uh, it's a great pleasure and honor to be uh, with you today online. Uh, I'm actually at the uh, Boston, uh, having a, uh, as a visiting professor in Harvard University. So uh, it's 9.30 uh, p.m. for me. Um, <clears throat> okay, so it's a, it's a great pleasure. So let me start by, uh, Okay, um, you already know uh, about uh, my background. 
uh, as an MD and also a PhD in informatics. I'm also a fellow uh, of the American College of Medical Informatics, the Australian College of Health Informatics, and the International Academy of Health Science Informatics. I'm also the editor-in-chief of the uh, a, a new journal called BMJ Health and Care Informatics, which is part of the BMJ uh, series. Um, so here I'm going to talk a little bit about the evolution of AI because AI, as, as many of you already know, it's, it's not a new thing, um, but it's regained our, our attention in the past 10 years. Um, it started in 1957 to be exact, uh, but since the coin month of the term a artificial intelligence, it has triggered a uh, uh, you know unlimited imagination of the people. So you know back in nineteen seventies, you can see cartoons and, and novels talking about what will be the future of the year two thousand, where robots will be everywhere serving all of us. You know, and humans don't have to do anything. It's all intelligent robot. Uh, but we're in two twenty. We're over year two thousand for twenty one years now. And we don't see any robot you know, in our home that's actually doing anything useful. Uh, so AI um, has been through a uh, evolution. In the 1990s, it's mostly about representing human knowledge, meaning use hu how do we put human knowledge, especially the knowledge of expert into a computer system that a computer will be able to execute. Um, that did not work very well. You know, after 30 years of research, the outcome, the performance is not well. Uh, one reason is on the image. You can look at the image on my slide, on my right-hand side. Um, you, if you think it's a dog, then you're probably an alien, right? So you, if you look at it, you know it's a cat. Um, but when I ask you, why is it a cat and not a dog? Uh, then you can you try to explain, okay, the eyes are wrong and the ears are kind of a reverse triangle and the, and the, you know, the color of the fur looks like cats, but, but actually, and, and the tails are flurry and all that. But actually, when you look at this specific cat, there's nothing independently, there's nothing of, of, of its feature that cannot be found uh, on dogs, right? You can find a dog that, that has eyes like that. Yeah, you can have dog with furs like that, and you have dog with, with ears like that, and, and also tail like that. But but when everything's put together, we, we, we feel, we know that it's a cat, not a dog, okay? So apparently the way that ask a human expert, what is, how do you describe a cat or, you know, what makes a cat? It's not very reliable, you know. Sometimes there are things we just know and we just cannot express. Um, it's called tacit knowledge. So, uh, so then we eventually we divide knowledge into explicit knowledge, which you can state very clearly, and tacit knowledge, which you just know but you cannot, you know, really clearly tell everyone. Okay, um, and until okay until after year 2000, we start to have uh, data because we started to have internet. So with internet comes the big data. And with big data, there is an algorithm called machine learning, which is not new either. Machine learning was invented almost as early as AI. So machine learning was invented in 1960 something, 1970s. Um, so with machine learning, if you feed the machine or the, the, the computer enough data, good data, the, the computer will be able to learn. Um, yes? Okay. Is there a question? I cannot hear the question. You're muted. Uh, Corey, are you trying to say something? Oh, okay, sorry. I thought I thought you're okay. anyway. I thought you have a question. Okay. Um, so with the big data now, uh, machine learning started to become a popular algorithm 
again because of the internet. However, for healthcare, you cannot find a lot of healthcare data on the internet, right? Because of privacy, because of all, all kinds of reasons. Um, so where do we find the big data for healthcare? We found it from electronic health record, right? Claims record. And also from, now we are building more public health databases, uh, you know, healthcare database for learning, for machine learning purpose. Um, so because of the internet, uh, we we're able to collect a lot of images. Um, a project by Dr. Professor Li Fei Fei in, uh, in Stanford back in the 2011 called ImageNet. She collected hundreds of millions of images actually from uh, Google mostly um, and allow the fast development of imaging recognition algorithm, machine learning based algorithm called CNN. Um, to be perfected after the project. So now if we use AI to recognize a random image from the internet and the AI tell us what are the objects that they recognize in any random image, AI has an accuracy of about 94%, which is actually even better than average human. The other project um, recently accomplished uh, or, or released by a company called OpenAI, which is also one of the Elon Musk, you know, the famous Elon Musk company, um, the Tesla and SpaceX Elon Musk, by the way. Um, the company announced something called GPT-3, and it's not a lever function GDP, it's, the, uh, it's a general pre-trained -te pre text. Um, it's a text processing algorithm that's able to write articles, English articles, and actually uh, in different languages as well. It's not only English. It has trained itself. I mean, human feed that this, this AI with 175 billion internet articles. Okay, so it, it, it's able to actually understand the article and write similar articles. Um, so, in GPT-2, even in its previous um, version, it's able to write a, a whole article based on just three lines. If you can see on the top of the screen, um, there are three lines. These are written by human, okay? Saying in a shocking finding, scientists discover a herd of unicorns uh, living in a remote previously and explore valley in the Andes mountain and so on and so forth. So human write, wrote the three lines. And the computer, the AI actually generated a whole article, you know, based on the three, uh, based on the, the, the paragraph the human wrote and iterate the whole story. Um, it even tells you what's the name of the leader of the exploration team, you know, how they found the, the unicorn and all that. But apparently these are hypothetical. But as you can see, AI has already been able to write like human and to understand images uh, and so on and so forth. That's why people think it's with a very high potential. And with it, using that kind of predictive uh, capability or to complete the income, to complete the missing piece, as you can see on the left hand side, these are the original graph. And it was only shown that the upper half, uh, we only show the upper half of the picture to the AI and the AI would imagine what's the lower half. And so as you can see, you know, these are very convincing examples, uh, especially the cat example on the second, uh, on the second row, you can see that under the right eye of the cat, there's a white line and the computer were able to imagine that this white line is probably the, head, the cat holding a book, you know, um, or the cat holding a piece of paper, things like that. So um, as you can see, we are already uh, being able to predict what will be missing in the image uh, with a pretty convincing uh, uh, accuracy. <clears throat> so these are the forces that's driving, uh, the disrupting forces that's shaping the future. Um, people give it a list from A to edge and A stands for AI, B stands for blockchain, 
C, cloud computing that we're using every day. D is big data. E is edge computing, which, which means that our wearable devices, our cell phone, um, a lot of computing are happened there. Um, it's kind of the, the other way of, of cloud computing. F stands for FinTech, which is the financial transaction. Now, you know, a lot of uh, money has gone and, and uh, it's all digital banking and, and, and digital uh, currency. G stands for 5G or 6G, much faster wireless. And from A to G, they are contribute to edge, which is digital health. Um, and as we learn from the pandemic, unfortunately, um, if we don't have health, if we cannot have a good healthcare system, we don't just lose health, we lose everything. We lose our financial system, we lose our everyday life. If if we have a disease that the healthcare system cannot contain, we don't just lose health, right? We lose money, we lose our financial, we, lo we lose our lives. So um, whatever technology we need to contribute to that digital health, we need to uh, be aware of and we need to invest in them. So um, as mentioned by our host, uh, EMEA stands for International Medical Informatics Association. Um, it's, a, it's an NGO under WHO established uh, in 1967 with about 60 member countries. Um, it's the largest and the most representative international organization on medical informatics. So the current president is Dr. Sabine Koch from Sweden. Uh, I'm going to uh, take over from October this year. EMEA feel a, a, a compelling um, reason to write a letter to the WHO last year um, stating that optimal use of informatics or IT uh, can be quite helpful in, in a pandemic situation. So in the letter, um, we actually listed four different uh, points, four, four major points. One is preemptive. Uh, you, we need to be able to use AI and, and uh, predict uh, and prepare uh, and be preemptive, not just be reactive uh, all the time. Uh, and the second uh, point is to, le to legitimize the use of telemedicine. Uh, so as you can see, like the US um, started to pay for telemedicine with all our pri all their private and public health insurance companies since the March last year, um, well, actually March, uh, uh, yeah, March in 2019, and the tenements in use actually soared 400 uh, percent in the U.S. Um, and about 50 percent of all the doctors has engaged in in one form of telemedicine or another. And more than 60, 50% of the patients that experience, you know, they have experience with telemedicine and they feel like they would rather take telemedicine than a uh, face-to-face in-person visit whenever applicable. So number three is uh, about sharing uh, data in order to create high quality big data that we can use to, uh, to fight the pandemic. And number four is, of course, transparency. Uh, actually, the cause, the root cause of this whole pandemic of COVID-19 maybe leads to the lack of transparency from some country. Uh, that's why the disease gets to spread before we even know uh, about it. So transparency, of course, will be uh, quite important. Um, my own suggestions after this you know, very important lesson. Although the topic says uh, AI in early medicine for the post-pandemic era, but we're not actually post-pandemic yet. We're kind of in the middle of the pandemic, um, especially uh, in Taiwan after 200 days of zero cases. Uh, about three weeks ago, we start to have you know, 200, 300, 400 cases every day. Uh, it's back to like 300 yesterday, but but still, um, now we're far from zero cases. Uh, so so I, I don't think, and, and the mutation is coming, so uh, I don't think it's over yet. 
Uh, but even before it's over, we should rethink what we're doing in healthcare and, and we should use AI a lot more than we're using them right now. So my suggestion is that we need to be smart in every way. Um, we need to use AI in every part of the healthcare and we need to practice, be able to practice healthcare in place, meaning you need to be able to um, do that in your home, um, like we're doing everything in our home right now, right? I mean, in a lot of countries, you know, uh, we're, doing, we're exercising WFH or work from home. Um, and so if you work from home, you should be able to get your healthcare from home. Um, and the third point, which is also the key today, is we need to get healthcare intervention early and earlier, um, not late and later. Um, the whole reason the pandemic it is, is what it is today is that the closure of borders, the closure of direct flights from Wuhan. Uh, in Taiwan, we closed the direct flight from Wuhan on, on 2019, January, 23rd January. Okay. And two weeks uh, after three weeks, the US closed the direct flight from Wuhan. And then another two weeks, the Europe closed it, closed the direct flight from Wuhan. But the difference of four weeks and six weeks, you know, five weeks, six weeks, actually means millions of peoples of difference, right? So people just flew out of Wuhan to everywhere in the world, um, especially in the US and, uh, and especially in Europe or, or Italy. Um, so, so if we can do things earlier, you know, just one week earlier, you know, one month earlier, it can mean the difference between heaven, you know, and, 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 and hell. So uh, it, it will be a big difference. So smart in every way means that we use AI, not only in radiology, which you see a lot, right? Because image, the algorithm to recognize image, um, also medical image has been um, quite revolutionary and it, it has been uh, having a very good performance, but actually AI can be used very effectively also in emergency room, you know, outpatient department, inpatient department, intensive care unit, uh, uh, or, or operating, uh, operating theater, operating room, as well as radiology. So it's not just radiology, there are so many different uses and we need to use them in every way. And AI, not only for image, it's only for text, it's also for text, um, and we also use it, it's also can be very effective on biosignals and especially codes. We used to think that, oh, uh, for coded data, we can yeah, just use statistics. But machine learning based AI actually provides us capability way beyond what the current statistics can do. The current statistic deal with like 20 variables um, or 15 variables, and it's already quite difficult to explain, right? If you put like 15 variables in a, in a regression model, in a nonlinear like logistic regression model, 15 variables are quite difficult, difficult to explain, not to mention that 30 variables. But you use machine learning based AI, you can easily deal with 300 variables or even 3000 variables. Um, and the model fitting, the nonlinear interaction and, and association can be quite accurately modeled by the machine learning. Uh, algorithms. So, and AI are not only for care providers. Um, like we see some AI examples for hospitals, for doctors, but we also need to develop more AI applications for patients and also for administrators and insurers, uh, especially patients, because we, I mentioned we want to be earlier, right? If AI are only used for providers, it's not early enough because you have to wait until the patient feel uncomfortable, like the patient uh, already feel ill, and then they go to the doctor and the doctor use AI, but then it's a little late, right? So if we can have, we can develop more tools for the patient, then it become earlier uh, and things will be much better when it's early. 
the second recommendation, my personal recommendation is um, healthcare in place, which is quite simple and quite straightforward. Actually, we need to do everything. We need to be able to do everything uh, in a remote way, like screening. We need to be able to do telescreening. Of course, I'm talking about digital screening. If we need to get bio sample like we do for PCR or RAP, rapid antigen test, of course, you still have to uh, contact, you have to in-person visit. But imagine that kind of risk, you know, together hundreds of thousands of people, hundreds of all thousands of people in one site, on one site, and have them open their mouth, uh, took off their mask. This is actually great risk to the people who's, who's uh, there at the same time. Um, so if we can uh, use digital screening to decide who is high risk before they even go to a place for RAT or PCR, that will reduce, that will greatly reduce the unnecessary risk for people who's not actually at risk for uh, COVID-19. Um, and teleconsultation, of course, now it's been very popular. Tele-intervention, there, there are a lot of things that uh, um, have been proven useful, like sleep disorder, like the mental disorder, uh, you know, psychological consultation, uh, psychiatric consultation has been proven quite, quite useful, and we can use tele-intervention to, to, to conduct them. Um, telemonitoring for chronic ill patient and also extended tele-surveillance. That means if we can monitor something for a long time, we monitor a patient for a long time, AI will be the perfect way to do it because for apparent reason, uh, human cannot stay on the monitor for a long time because human just get tired very easily. Um, so that's my second um, suggestion. And my third suggestion, which is actually what I'm, my, my main thing today is early and earlier, meaning we know, we already knew that if we can deal with the disease earlier, like if we can do early diagnosis, we can do early intervention, patient will become much better, right? Patient turns out to have much better outcome. The healthcare costs are much lower um, and the quality of life is much better. However, it's easier said than done. You know, how do you, how do, you do earlier? Um, in order to, 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 to become earlier in medicine, you need to be able to predict and you need to be able to predict individually. Okay, not predict a group of people, but predict every specific person in a very accurate and timely way, right? Um, actually, a prediction would have to be, you know, individualized and accurate and timely and actionable to be useful, right? So in order to make the, uh, wait, let me see that. Okay, so in order to do that, we, we don't have a good tool until now that we have AI, especially machine learning based AI that we can actually predict diseases, prediction, disease screening, disease monitoring, disease progression and anti-progression of the disease. I'm, I will provide examples for all of these in our following slides. Um, and for prediction of prognosis, mortality prediction, uh, for example, during the height of COVID-19, doctors in the intensive care unit were facing a very difficult decision of who to put on the ventilators because there are not enough ventilators for all the patients. If we can have an accurate prediction of the mortality, then we know who to put on the, who will be on the, the priority list, you know, for uh, getting on a ventilator. Uh, and we can sequence them, uh, you know, uh, accordingly. Um, and, and AI are also quite useful, not just earlier in the disease, but also earlier before the disability, okay? Disability means uh, after the disease, we're already in a rehabilitation stage. But then if some people say they're high risk of falling, 
and we predicted that, then we can stop the falling, which will in turn cause a great loss of disability, you know, a great, you know, um, loss of, uh, of uh, independent abilities. So in, in that way, if we can predict disability, we're able to prevent disability, right? So that's uh, um, really something that we want to do. Okay. So, and I'm not the first one who talked about this, you know, early and earlier, um, in the earliest medical books in the world that's published 3,500 years ago, uh, called the Canon of Medicine, Canon of Medicine, it says in the first chapter, the book says best doctors focus to keep patient healthy. And the average doctors work on the sub healthy patient. And mundane doctors, you know, like myself, we are all trained as a mundane doctors, treat only the ill, right? We can we can treat patient only when they're ill. If the patient come to your clinic and they they tell you, oh, oh I'm I'm not very comfortable, I'm having some discomfort here and there, and you you did the examination, you draw some blood, you do some image works, and and you you told the patient, sorry, nothing is wrong with you because all the tests came up normal. Why don't you wait until you are really sick, you know, to to see us? So the current doctors don't know how to work with people that's healthy and sub healthy. They only work with the diseases because that's how we're educated. And and it is true that the not not you know, not until today or recently do we have the tool to actually look at all the information of a single patient and provide a individualized accurate risk profiling of a patient, you know, which is the, uh, which I refers to, of course, the, is the AI tools um, that we did not have before. That's why I associate AI to earlier medicine because everybody wants to be earlier. But how do you do that? You need to use AI. And how, how, what, you know, in what way do you use AI to do that? Um, I, uh, we published uh, a, an article with uh, our colleagues from MIT um, in the Journal of Medical Internet Research uh, saying that earlier medicine refers to, uh, that's our definition, to the temporal predictive and proactive approach to individualized health enabled by innovative AI modeling plus longitudinal personal health big data. I'm sorry, it's a mouthful. I mean, it's a very long definition. Um, but basically, if we collect enough good quality patient data along with the timeline, meaning you collect the patient data as early as you can, uh, it would be better if you start collecting patient data since their birth, right? Since a person um, is is giving is given birth to you in the hospital, you start collecting all the data, medical data. I mean, um, not necessarily all the data, but medical data. So, in after several years, we have a temporal um, and longitudinal personal health big data, and using that data we are able to refocus medical practice to not just dealing with what happens now, but also to what will happen in the foreseeable future. Okay, so as I said, we need to be able to use AI um, to do earlier medicine. And, and it's not only in the prediction or prevention of disease, it's also in the prediction of the progression of disease to stop them earlier. It's also in the prediction of disability to prevent them earlier and pre to prevent people from deteriorating into disabled. Um, and, and these predictions, these AI-based predictions needs to be individualized, accurate, timely, and actionable in order to be useful. For example, if you predict somebody to uh, that uh, you have a chance of cancer uh, between 3% to 55%. That's not very accurate. And, and that's not very useful for that person either, right? 
um, if you tell a person that, oh, people in your age group has a 25% chance of getting diabetes, that's not very useful to me because, because I'm only, I'm one of the people in my age group, but I'm not the same as other people. So just telling me what's in, what's gonna happen in my age group doesn't make it applicable to myself. And if I, if we predict somebody will have cancer uh, within 30 years, that's not very useful either because it takes too long and, and patient will not know how to, what to do. Okay, and it has to be actionable, meaning the predicting point is something that we can actually change um, in order to change the course of the, the disease or the health uh, trajectory. So let me give you one example of what I mean, because uh, until now, all you heard about is, is the term early medicine. So let me give you some example. Uh, we develop a, as a dermatologist, um, we develop a app called Momi. So if you're interested, you can scan Momi on the QR code on my left lower corner. Um, it, it will add to your line. I think most of people in Indonesia also use the line, line app. Um, if you have line, then you scan for the QR code. It will add a friend called Momi to your line and you will be able to use line, to use Momi and just take a photo of your skin mole, pigmented skin mole on any part of your body. And um, the app will tell you whether it's, the risk is high enough that you need, to, you need to see a doctor or not. Okay, so this is a case that a mother brought her 90 year old boy, a big boy and said, Oh, uh, mo your mommy says it's high ri higher risk. So uh, I brought my boy to to your clinic, and we did a biopsy. It was a dysplastic nevus or a premalignancy. So as you can see, it's like a flower. You know, it's it's small, but it's like a flower. You know, with this bloom um, on the uh, I was petals on the back of this 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 ninety year old boy. This is another um, twenty one year old female. Uh, she had this pigmented mole on her palm for a while. And she told us that she used Momi and it's higher risk. So we did a biopsy and it was melanoma in situ, meaning it's a stage zero malignant melanoma. And she was ha very happy because when we, when we excised it, we cut it off and that's it. Um, just do a little bit of wider excision and she's cured. But if she waited until it becomes stage two or stage three, four, then she might need to get an amputation, you know, cut off the whole hand and a lot of tachytherapy and, and chemotherapy and the quality of life and survival will be much, much worse. Uh, and this is what I'm talking about, about earlier medicine, meaning if we can really, for example, if we can predict most cancer and prevent them at stage zero or stage one, then we basically cured cancer, right? Because most cancers are curable, totally curable at stage zero or stage one. But if you wait until through stage three or four, then the cost is like a thousand more, uh, you know, a thousand times higher cost and very bad survival for many cancers. And the quality of life that, that goes through the chemotherapy and all that, it's crazy. So um, we should invest more, a little more on the earlier part of the medicine using AI to reduce the cost of healthcare and, and improve the quality of care. So everybody wins, right? And you don't even need to spend more money. You know, a small investment would mean a lot to uh, the disease, uh, early detection of the disease. So we published this uh, uh, paper in British Journal of Medicine, uh, British Journal of Dermatology, or BJD, it's one of the best dermatology uh, journal, um, that we compare the performance of the app, which is the red line on my right-hand side, the performance of this app compared to family physicians, about 20, 30 family physicians, uh, they're represented in the green triangle, as you can see, the red line, the app actually performed better 
the most of the physicians. You know, only one physician has a comparable performance uh, with the app, and the rest are a little under. You know, they are good, but they're not as good as the app. So this is a good example for earlier risk determination for pigmented moles. And you can think of many, many similar applications, right? This is only for pigmented moles. You can do that for uh, eye problem. You can do that for hair problem. You can do that for many other problems as well. Um, we also did something about uh, prediction of adverse, uh, major adverse cardiac events, um, which the best clinical practice so far is using a scoring system. Uh, there are several of them, heart, SOFA, and, and uh, there are several scoring systems to predict the re occurrence of, ma of major adverse cardiac events or MACE, M-A-C-E. Um, the current scoring system can prevent MACE in a in 90, in 40, in 60 days, uh, sorry, in 30 days, with an accuracy of about 70%. But using a machine learning AI, we're able to predict 90 days uh, at an accuracy of about 90%. So uh, this is also published in IEEE access. Um, so it's, it, it, the potential is quite high. Um, and we also published another one, um, um, on, my, uh, on the top uh, of the screen called statin use its impact on EGFR TKI resistance. Um, EGFRI is a type, popular type of drugs called target therapy drug for cancer. Um, it's quite effective for some cancers, but, but it will become resistant in a few years. So, so we use AI to find out, to do a temporal prediction for drug resistance Meaning if you use statin um, for a while, you know, for a, a longer time, you might actually prolong the time that the, the drug become resistant. So the EGFR will be able to be used on cancer patient for longer. And the second example is, uh, the second and the third examples are actually papers from this lab that I'm with uh, in, in Harvard University uh, with Dr. David Bates and Dr. Uh, Zhou Li. Um, they published this paper. The second one is estimating time to progression of chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases with tolerance. Uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD is a condition that uh, most people who smoke for after several years so it will develop COPD. And um, they develop a model uh, with the timeline um, and that, that will be able to do a temporal prediction. Temporal prediction means a time-related, right? Time-related prediction for uh, disease for progression. And the third paper on the bottom of the screen is a temporal prediction for, for disability prevention, which specifically on um, people with dementia. Um, so they're able to predict whether uh, this dementia, people with dementia um, will be beneficial from getting a early palli palliative care intervention so they don't have to die early. Okay, um, so, so what is the temporal prediction? It's, it's based on what happened in the past can determine what will happen in the future, right? So among all the things that we want to predict, uh, cancer is one of the diseases, I mean, one type of diseases that we really like to know earlier. Just as I said uh, before, if we can know cancer a little earlier, we can benefit from uh, treating it much, much, much earlier, much easier. So we look at patients, each patient, uh, we look at the diagnosis in the past three years and the drugs in the past three years, um, and we, we compose that with the timeline, we compose that as a two-dimensional two map. We call it temporal phenomenon maps. Um, and we use this map to predict whether a patient is gonna, going to develop cancer in the next 12 months. So we use it on many different cancers, uh, on liver cancer, on prostate cancer, colorectal cancer, 
and even skin cancer. This means non-melanoma skin cancers. So, and, and also lung cancers. So lung cancers we, were published uh, in the Journal of Medical Internet Research. For skin cancer, we published on JAMA Dermatology, which is like the best journal for dermatology right now. Um, so let me give you an, an example of prostate cancer. Um, let me see how much time do we have? Yeah, I think we have five minutes. Um, so this is how we predict prostate cancer. We use about 2000 variables, um, including all the diagnosis and all the age, ages. As you can see, if you're familiar with odds ratio, you know that um, there is a place, odds ratio 8.75, um, as you can see, odds ratio 8.75, this is hyperplasia of prostate. This is a variable that clinically is probably the most important clinical variable that clinician will use to predict prostate cancer. But in a machine learning model, um, this variable doesn't even make it to the top 10. See, it's, it's down here. And the reason being, um, using the machine learning variable, uh, we're able to, uh, we're actually able um, to use all the variables and the variables are able to explain away uh, what's happened, you know, uh, in, in hyperplasia in this single variable. So in, 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 in short, clinicians use very small amount of variables to determine the disease because our human brain works best with less than seven variables, right? If I, if I ask some, any of you to remember seven different things, uh, it will be quite difficult. You know, if I just give you seven random words and, and, and you record it after five minutes, it will be quite difficult. But if I give you 700 different random things, you will, you will remember less than 1% you know, of, of all the 700 things. But in, for computers, processing 2,000 variables is not a problem. And they will never forget too, right? Um, so uh, I think our medicine, you know, the future of medicine is facing a big challenge. We probably will have to rewrite all our textbooks. Um, so a disease is no longer like 20 pages of Harrison. Um, it will have to be a table, right? A table of 2,000 or 20,000 variables that you can always reference. Uh, it's not something that you just, uh, uh, okay, number one, number two, number three, and we call it a triade. And then you, you have the top five criteria, and top seven criteria. These will no longer work in the future. Uh, but with this kind of uh, tolerance of high number of, of variables, uh, high dimension of variables, we're able to predict disease in an accuracy that's never been seen before. So this is the, uh, if you're interested in the detail of the algorithm, uh, this is the paper that you can take a look at. Uh, it's probably the first paper or one of the very few papers that predicts skin cancer without even using an image of the skin. All we use are just variables in the, in the medical record, okay? Um, this is another paper that's just, just uh, it's publishing right now. Uh, is the, the temporal prediction of lung cancer that I just uh, mentioned. So um, in conclusion, that we used to look at patient's data as like there are five kinds of data, you know, in the electronic health record, uh, their patient profile, their diagnosis and problems, their procedures, their medications, and their lab and exams. Um, so we, we collect all the data, and these are only phenotype data. Uh, so we collect all the phenotype from birth to now, as well as we're gonna collect the environmental variables like you know, uh, CO2, like PM 2.5, PM 10, you know, uh, temperature, humidity. So the environment we're exposed to and the behavior that, that, that of our own, like do we exercise, do we smoke? You know, what do we eat? These are all behavior data. 
in microbiomes, now we know microbiome in the, in the guts and in the oral cavity and even on the microbiome on the skin are very important to our diseases uh, because we're actually uh, kind of uh, uh, dependent on the group of uh, uh, bacteria and, and microbes uh, that live on or in our body, right? And also genotype. So if we have all these variables, uh, I did an, a very rough estimate. It will not be more than 2 million variables. But if we have all the 2 million variables and we collect them from birth to now, we, we probably are going to be able to predict all the clinical events in the future, um, including diagnosis. And we'll be able to predict diagnosis before they even happen. Um, and, and we're able to, to treat to start treating the disease even before we have a disease, right? And start early with the rehabilitation, stop the disease in progression, and eventually prevent, not prevent, but prolong death, right? Or, or increase the quality of life before death. Uh, and that's, that's what we want for a healthcare system, right? So um, my conclusion is that the current medicine is focused too much on treatment. Um, so, so there are higher costs, and when the cost is so high and it's increased every year, you know, over the 40 years, um, most countries around the world cannot afford that kind of high cost healthcare. So they have to ask doctors, nurses, all the medical professionals to do more and get paid less, and get paid less, and that leads to burnout. Right, so people burn out. They, they refuse to become doctors. They refuse to do their nurse work uh, because the pay are less and the risks are too high. Uh, so eventually, that leads to a collapse of the healthcare system. Uh, as you can see, in many different countries, a, you know, a little bit, a few thousand patients a day uh, from the COVID nineteen would would actually overwhelm most healthcare system in the world. And when the healthcare system were overwhelmed, the patient will go into the community and trigger a nationwide infection. So that's really, really bad. We, our healthcare system is our last defense and we, we just cannot exist you know, without a good healthcare system. So we need to invest more in the healthcare system. But where do we invest? We should invest in AI plus big data plus temporal big data, a time-based big data, so we could initiate earlier medicine to trigger lower cost and better outcome and eventually leads to a sustainable healthcare system. So if you ask me, my opinion will be AI has to change the future of medicine or we may not even have a future. Okay, that would conclude my uh, report and my talk. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor Jackley. Uh, I think it's a very uh, excellent and very interesting presentations. Uh, yeah, starting from the history of uh, AI, which is actually already uh, since uh, 90s, uh, 60s. And also the uh, AI uh, is the key uh, of the earlier uh, medicines, which is, I think, very interesting. And also many examples of the implementations of uh, AI in the healthcare settings. So now I would like to invite the audience if uh, you have comments or uh, questions, uh, please. Me, sir. Pak pa Samsu? Yeah. Yeah, uh, silakan. Yeah, please. please. Terima kasih. Thank you. Uh, bisa lebih keras, Pak Samsu? Could you please uh, speak louder? Is that loud enough? A uh, little bit uh, more. Uh, okay. Well, um, <coughs> good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, uh, Professor Jack, uh, for a great presentation. Um, actually, uh, to see you in uh, this presentation, just remind me when uh, four years ago, I've been to Taipei Medical University here in pharmacy program. Um, well, uh, 
talking about your pre presentation this morning um, exactly just make me wow i'm in another uh planet right <laughs> yes uh as we know that uh artificial intelligence will change uh, every industry of life is that right okay um artificial intelligence what you explain professor jack is uh, the system that trained uh, to do the clear instructions based on this i can take the conclusions uh, but another uh, in other side we need to know what are the limitations of the artificial intelligence in our life so that we know uh, some of the 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 work that cannot do by the 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 people itself in uh, in life to in living together with the system of artificial intelligence as we know that uh, as you say that uh, the artificial intelligence is expecting to living together with us as a human but then uh, we couldn't we couldn't say that they can also uh, apa sih? Um, meniru ya uh, uh, meniru how people how people do as a human uh, so that was my question is what are the limitation professor uh, so that we know because my students my students as well were asking me about they they have a big worry in in medical officer if one day the artificial intelligence would also implement it in their work in in their jobs so yeah okay thank okay. you very much <laughs> thank you thank you that's a good question um well um the 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 limitation of course um for the ai application in healthcare right now especially uh, now the, the the most dominant or popular mechanism is machine learning machine learning depends greatly on the quality of data so if the data is low quality then the machine learning is uh, bad for, or will have a bad performance if the data are biased then the prediction will be biased okay so um as we can see some examples from other fields uh, there was a, uh, you know, crime prediction uh, AI that look at black people and they say they're criminal. So because the training data set is, is like most of the criminals are black. So, so if the training set is biased, of course, it's a long, uh, you know, known problem of machine learning. That, that's why I think in the next 10 years, we need to invest more in collecting better uh, time-based healthcare data, like better electronic health record, um, better behavior data, better environmental data. When we have a better data over time, then we're going to have a better AI, you know, with a more accurate prediction in order to do earlier medicine. Um, so the other question, and, and it's not free. I mean, um, getting, building the database is totally it takes time and take effort and, and it's not free. Um, I was, uh, you know, I, I'm from Taipei Medical University. We've been working on integrating the data from our three teaching hospitals for, for research and for machine learning. We've, we've been doing this since 2009, you know, and so it's already like 11 years ago um, and we're still not there yet. We're like 50, 60%. Um, however, uh, the, the hospital I'm working with is Brigham and Women's Hospital and also Mass General Hospital. They start to aggregate and, and, and start to pre uh, prepare their database for 30 years already. And it's not perfect. Of course, it's quite good, but it's not perfect yet. So it takes a long time. 
and, and, and a lot of effort to actually build a, a good high quality long term database for healthcare. So it's not something that you can just do right away. But of course, for some questions, you don't need a lot of data for some for, for more complex questions, then you need more complex data, right? For simple questions like um, the uh, the app that I introduced in, in my talk about pigmented skin mold, uh, when we collect 500 images, it, it was not good. 1,005 image, still not good. But after 3,000 image, it start become quite accurate. And now we have like 10, 100,000 images. So, so it become better and better over time. Um, the second question, the second part of the question is, is probably when AI are going to replace doctors. Um, well, I would know, I would not know, but, but <laughs> as a dermatologist, I get asked, I also got asked a lot that question by my colleagues, by my colleague, uh, by my fellow dermatologist. And, and I always joke that it will be after radiologists and pathologists, you know, after they, they lose their job, then it's the dermatologists. <laughs> um, but, you know, even radiologists, when are they going to lose their job? I mean, there will be an early sign, you know, of doctors being replaced by AI, right? Um, but I don't think within the next 20, 30 years, I still don't think that you can actually replace doctors, medical doctors, uh, you know, totally with AI. Not until you are willing to fly an airplane without a pilot, okay? If we all go on to an airplane and, and we know there's no pilot, it's only AI flying the airplane, and you're comfortable with that, then the next uh, step will be probably doctors, you know? <laughs> so, so if AI can replace a lot of jobs, doctor is probably on the, you know, on the, on the bottom of the list. It's not going to be on the, uh, and nurses too, right? So uh, we, as, and this you have robot and robot is going to be, you know, even longer, it took even longer. So, uh, so we're going to need our medical professional for a, a very long time. Yeah. I wouldn't worry about it in the next 20, 30 years. <laughs> thank you, Professor Jack. Terima kasih, Pak Lutfan. Yeah, yeah, terima kasih, Pak Samsu. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, actually, there are some questions already posted on the uh, chat room. Uh, Mbak Anifa, could you please uh, put on the slide the, the questions from the audience? Yeah, uh, <laughs> Professor uh, Jack Lee, there, uh, there are some questions uh, already posted on oh, okay. the chat room. Yeah, um, yeah. so one is... Uh... Many examples of AI utilization is to predict or monitor diseases that have long prognosis. How about emergency situation? Okay, such as traffic accidents. Uh, okay, that's also very important. Um, you know, emergency rooms are known to be overcrowded across different parts of the world, especially when you when we have COVID nineteen emergency room are always crowded and they're overwhelmed by all types of patients. Um, so uh, one thing AI is quite good is doing uh, a, a quick triage, okay? Um, so, and even before they enter the emergency room, uh, we could use an AI tool or an app on the cell phone or whatever, or in the, in the ambulance to do triage. Triage is like, the severity of the disease, right? So for a more severe patient, we'll go directly into the ER. For lower severity patient, maybe we, we could put them in a different area, not to mix with um, people with more severity or people with COVID-19. Of course, you will have to put them on a different uh, uh, channel. So um, it's very useful. It could be quite useful for the emergency room. I mean, AI could play so in terms of triage, in terms of dispatching different type of patients, and also in terms of catching errors. Because in the emergency room, if we do a CT, for example, sometimes we we'll just look at the, uh, okay. Um, so if we do a CT, for example, sometimes we will miss some of the feature. So a famous AI company actually is doing, uh, looking at all the emergency room CT images 
and trying to find diagnosis that's missing, especially for subdural hematoma. Um, so if the uh, people, they actually could find every month, they, find, they, they found 20 people uh, with subdural hematoma that's missed by the emergency room doctors because the doctors were focusing on something else and did not even find out. Yeah. So there are a lot of patients in emergency room, okay? Um, the second one is AI for healthcare can be autonomous system that can be used by community or should be a complementary of the um, steel country decision. Yeah, okay, um, so far in terms of liability or who's, who will be ultimately responsible for the patient, it's still human. We will never in the foreseeable future put the diability on the machine, right? So if if human make a mistake, human go to the court and human try to defend their own behavior. If machine make a mistake, if machine are the final decision maker, then the machine will be put in a court, and that 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 doesn't seem very uh, likely and very feasible at all. Uh, or you sue the company that produced the machine, and the company will just, you know, uh, fold, um, and it's not very useful either. So, um, still, as the uh, liability issue still lies with human, so human still the the ultimate decision maker. Then, of course, AI are used to help physicians. However, there are times that you cannot access a physician. For example. If you're in a, a remote area, you cannot find a physician. Of course, AI will have to do a decision, a temporal decision before the physician become available. Or in the middle of the night, all your recent, your, your clinic, all the clinic in your area, hospital area, they, they were not available, not open, then you, you could consult an AI physician and the AI physician will give you a decision until you can find a real human physician, right? So, so sometimes AI can also make an intermediate decision, but ultimately human will have to be responsible for the, uh, uh, for the final medical decisions. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, actually, um, there is still uh, some questions, but I think because of the uh, time, and uh, maybe we, if it is uh, possible to, uh, yeah, put on the slide. Uh, uh, of I the can questions see it. From I can, yeah. Okay. Okay. I can see. Okay. One yeah. more. One last question. Yeah. Um, with AI grows greater and greater, how should healthcare industry be prepared for accepting this? How about ethical issues? Okay. Yes. Um, that's a, oh, it's a good question. I mean, healthcare industries, like it or not, you will have to accept it. One or one way or the other, because um, it's like when CT were invented, some people would think, "Oh, I don't need to buy a CT or a CAT scan. I can just get by by taking multiple X-ray." But that's not the case, right? Now we all know you cannot replace CT by taking a lot of plate films. You have to have a CT in order to to have a 3D structure. So um, when we are dealing with more and more information, you know, some of the high-speed CT, they produce 4,000 images in one exam. And in the future, we could foresee, you know, machine that generate even more data. I mean, examination medical machine generate more data. So, so just imagine, you know, in the future, the kind of data loading that's going to be put on doctors. If you don't have AI, how can you handle that? You're not able to practice medicine. You're not able to, how do you look at 4,000 images before you see a patient? You don't have that kind of time, right? So AI will have to have, help you pick up out of the 4,000 images, they pick 10 and say, these are the most important 10. And if you see some of them, if you want to see some relevant images, you could click on it and it goes to relevant images. But but all you know, you don't have to look at all the 4,000 images, right? The patient could wear a wearable device and it monitor the heart rate for, you know, uh, 90 days. How do you look at 90 days of ECG? You cannot, you, you, should, you need a machine 
or AI to help you screen on the 90 days of electronic cardiac graph and tell you what are the significance, right? So, um, I mean, just, just even just about data overloading, you will need AI anyway. So, um, and it's, it's, it's totally ethical because human will still have to make the final decision with their limited time and limited um, energy and you know, the risk of burnout and all that. Uh, I, I would just, I, I'll predict if eventually if a healthcare system, if, if the hospital do not adopt some of the AI tools, all the doctors and nurses will have to leave the hospital because they got burned out in those hospitals that don't use AI, right? So, so they will work, they're overloaded, they, they, they get disease, they get ill themselves. So they will leave to other hospitals using AI. Um, that would naturally make people think about it. And the healthcare industry will have to adopt some of the critical AI anyway. Mm. Yeah. Um, would you please to answer uh, this one more, Professor Jack D? So I think this will be the last questions uh, okay. from um, uh, so Chan. Yeah. This yes, expansion in the volume of artificial intelligence research. Um, at the same time, we have begun to see many uh, rapidly translating research in the clinical. Um, how to verify? Okay, that's yeah, a good question. Yeah. Um, it, it's like very verifying AI medicine is is like verifying any new drugs, new device in medicine. You go through FDA. Okay, so you have to present enough clinical evidence through clinical trial. Um, in in the U.S. FDA in Taiwan's FDA. We, we use something called SAMD, software as medical device. You know, if, if this AI involved only software, you, we, we could look at it like, like SAMD uh, or software as medical device. We use the uh, criteria to evaluate SAMD. And it's a little bit like just medical device. You need to have clinical data in a clinical trial. You have to do before, after, you have to have a sample size that's representative enough and show the effect and the safety and all that. Um, the one major difference between AI and medical devices are AI tend to be revising a lot. Meaning machine learning, if we pass through FDA using 3000 images, but now we have a 100,000 image version that's much more accurate. Do we have to redo all the clinical trial or, or or we just update it. That's still a question mark, okay? But that's detail. Uh, for most AI, they have to go through the FDA approval in order to be used clinically, safely, and responsibly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Shekli, uh, because okay. uh, the, we already run off time, but uh, thank you very much for your uh, space. I think it's uh, really wonderful. And actually you point out also uh, our uh, problem in the health system that uh, we have a deficit in our national health insurance. And I think this will be uh, the strategy to make it better that the IE will be the future of medicine and uh, to expect uh, that uh, yeah, the uh, healthcare cost will be lower as well as to increase the better outcome. So once again, uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, it's already, I think, late uh, night in Boston uh, and yeah. Uh, hopefully we can uh, uh, meet again in the next futures and yeah thank you for all our, uh, all of the audience and yeah uh, we uh, close the sessions and yeah uh, selamat malam uh, selamat siang dan uh, sampai jumpa lagi terima kasih thank you thank you thank you bye bye thank you bye 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 thank you thank yeah you. thank you so much prof Lee, and thank you dr lutfan that's such an attractive information baik bapak ibu uh, kita sudah sampai pada akhir kegiatan pada pagi hari ini ya uh, di awal acara saya sudah menyampaikan bahwa di akhir acara akan ada penyampaian door prize untuk peserta yang aktif dan beruntung ya karena panitia akan mengacak uh, nama bapak ibu yang akan mendapatkan door prize ini saya masih menunggu dari panitia untuk menyampaikan namanya uh, karena sudah waktu juga kami dari segenap tim mengucapkan terima kasih kepada pembicara, moderator dan seluruh peserta yang berkenan meluangkan waktu untuk hadir dan berpartisipasi dalam acara ini mohon maaf atas segala kekurangan
Ya baik, uh, kami akan menghubungi segera Bapak Ibu apabila uh, mendapatkan door press, ya. Uh, kami akan menghubungi melalui nomor yang tertera di dalam registrasi. Saya tutup selanjut uh, selamat melanjutkan aktivitas. Salam sehat. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bu Imelda. Baik Bapak Ibu, uh, di layar sudah tertampil pemenang door prize guest lecture pada pagi hari ini. Selamat kepada Bapak Syamsuriansyah dan uh, Bapak Ibu Nur Rohman. Ge. Uh, pemenang akan dihubungi oleh panitia untuk penyampaian door prize-nya. Terima kasih. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Terima kasih.